Who Owns the Past by Francisco Vargas. Part of being an anthropologist and working in the field of anthropology is looking at things holistically. This is something that is ingrained in us from the very beginning, from the very first introductory classes that we take to the most advanced readings we do for our research projects. As anthropologists, we constantly have to try to be alert of the people and culture that we are studying and how they feel on the work we do. I first came across this topic on my first year of community college. The professor asked us who owns the past and showed us examples of two topics that really put this question into perspective. ISIS destroying historical sites and Greece asking for stone models back from England. But those two aren't the only examples. They range from a variety of things from Aborigines in Australia, Native Americans in the United States, and artifacts being stolen during World War II. There is many ways to ask this question, to think about it, and to try to answer it. In the article, Who Really Owns the Past? Carly Meyer says, Anybody who dips even slightly into these matters will find that the waters are choppy. The first example is Greece. Greece wants the Parthenon marbles back from the British Museum, trying to reinvigorate a long-standing campaign for the 2,500-year-old treasures. British diplomat Lord Elgin removed the sculptures from the Acropolis in Athens in the early 19th century when Greece was under Ottoman rule. They comprised roughly half of the 160-meter-long stretch that was on the Parthenon Temple. Since independence in 1832, Greece has reportedly requested their return without success. Greece has stepped up its campaigns in 2009 when it opened a new museum at the foot of the Acropolis Hill. Britain has resisted campaigns for the return of what it calls the Elgin Marbles, along with treasures from other countries including Nigeria and Ethiopia, often citing legislation that bans its museum from permanently disposing of their collections. And as the president of Greece said, the marbles belong to the world cultural heritage, but their natural place is the Parthenon. These marbles were made by the ancient Greeks and are being asked for by the current Greek people who believed that they should be returned to the rightful culture and, origi and originators, but should, but should England return them? The English also argued that they took them at times of turmoil for Greece and were taken to England so that they would be, so that they would not be destroyed. Should England return the marbles back to Greece? Another point of view to look at this topic from is the eyes of a native. In the U.S., this has been a long... Another point of view to look at this topic is from the eyes of a native. The U... In the U.S., this has been a huge topic for debate throughout the years. In the article, Who Owns the Past? from the magazine Scientific American, they say archaeologists and anthropologists of yore treated Native Americans disgracefully looting their graves and using their remains to argue for intellectual inferiority of Native Americans to people of Caucasian descent. Many tribes have seen this as an issue and have asked for their ancestors and material culture back. Many tribes worried that museums were stalling on identifying their remains to avoid having to return them, even though these are valuable things to history and anthropology and biology. Native Americans have seen it as disrespect that they have not been given back their property. Some are even willing to collaborate and work with scholars. Many Native Americans do not object to studies per se, but to analysis that destroy remains. But should scholars continue to keep remains in material culture for the sake of studies? Another Native view is the Aborigines in Australia. In the article Who Owns the Past? Aborigines as Captives of the Archives, the author argues and tells us that even though there are laws that allow Aborigines to be able to look at documents that talk about their past and, or studies on them, it is difficult for them to even look at. It is difficult to, for them to even look at these articles. She says, virtually all of these records encompassed in the handbook exist in centralized locations, primarily the capital cities and frequently across the state borders, thousands of kilometers away from the communities to whom they have relevance. Furthermore, Aboriginal communities themselves have no library facilities in which they, the records and documents can be held and used. Another issue the author brings up is the fact that a lot of information, articles, and studies of Aboriginal people are held in private collections, which make it very hard to be able to release any of that information to the Aboriginal people due to copyright laws. 
Another angle of Aboriginal struggle to reclaim things that they originated is their art. In 2015, the British Museum in London held a showing of contemporary Aboriginal art spanning a 60,000 year range. The art, which was being held by multiple Australian outlets, let England borrow them. Indigenous activists began to protest the morality of them returning to England and how they had never been returned to the people themselves. The activists argued that the objects in London and Canberra exhibitions are not the material remnants of past lives, but the very real connections to their history and their ancestors. It's hard to know who owns cultures, histories, and documents, especially if the descendants of those they were taken from are all still around. A strong ar argument is that the past is the possession of those in power. The past belongs to the victor. But is this argument true? After World War II, Eisenhower assigned a unit called Monuments Men to prevent looting from happening from both soldiers and the Soviet Union. But if these constant quotes are true about the winners owning the past and writing history, then why is looting the defeated enemy wrong? To this day, Russia has refused to give back trophies they, they claimed from Germany after World War II. As the author says, the problem is that restitution procedures are cumbersome and near impossible to enforce. In the case of other undocumented objects looted from archaeological sites, how can victimized countries press a claim when confirming evidence is lacking? In another article, Who Owns the Spoiled War?, they bring up the point that Germany also stole valuables and relics from Russia and their museums at the time of war, and that they have not returned them. Russian Ministry of Cultures said that Germans' actions were not justified, but those of the Soviet Union were, because with Hitler's defeat, there was no German state, and since the Soviet Union was the legitimate governing authority in its occupation zone, it had every right to remove cultural property. Just as the Soviet Union deemed it fit to take trophies and relics from Germany, so did Hitler and the Germans. Hitler ordered special agents to take pieces of art, treasure, and collections from those they had conquered. Polish, Polish museums were stripped and royal palaces destroyed. Slavs were deemed inferior, their history worthless. So, when is it okay to take relics and pieces of culture? When is it okay to destroy someone's history? It has been done so many times through history, but is it okay? Or should these pieces of culture and history be respected during times of war? A recent example of this is with ISIS. In 2015, ISIS was attacking Iraq and one of the groups that they focused on was the Assyrian group. They not only focused on attacking the people, but also their culture and history. Tom Holland, a historian, told The Guardian, it's a crime against Assyria, against Iraq, and against humanity. Destroy the past and you control the future. The Nazis knew this, and the Khmer Rouge, and the Islamic State clearly understand it too. The destruction of major historic sites turned people's heads and made countries like Italy ask UN to create a military unit to protect ancient sites. After bulldozing and destroying many sites, ISIS was condemned as committing war crimes. The same actions Germany, the US, Soviet Union, and Spanish conquistadors got away with and continue to get away with. So, whose job is it to maintain the past and to keep relics? Who gets to dictate these things and why? And why do some places, actions, and things get more coverage than others? The question remains and will perhaps remain for a long time. Who owns the past?